Welcome. Hi. I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Morning, everyone. Hope you've had you are having a great week as we head on into the first week of May. Can you even believe it? I should be doing an off-road marathon this weekend actually uh, if my calf plays the game. So I'm super excited to head down to the mountain and the little camper van and if I'm not doing it then I will be cheering on the hubster who will be doing his uh, 42k off-road um, along with a couple of mates who are also down doing some events. So I hope you've got something awesome planned for this weekend. Now today I bring to you my conversation with Tommy Wood. I'm sure that anyone who is in the health and wellness space, as I said last week, will absolutely know who Dr. Tommy Wood is. But for those of you who don't, he is in the research faculty at the University of Washington in the Department of Pediatrics. And he has completed his PhD looking at ways to increase the resilience of and treat injury of the developing brain. My goodness, Tommy is an absolute brainiac. And when he accepted my invitation to come speak to me, of which I was most pleased, I then had to figure out what on earth I wanted to talk to him about because he is across all topics in that health, wellness, and longevity space. And I found Tommy, basically, as everyone would have found Tommy, first and foremost on Nourish, Balance, Thrive with Christopher Kelly, who has also been on the podcast. So Tommy Wood has a medical degree from the University of Oxford, PhD in Physiology and Neuroscience from the University of Oslo, and he currently resides in Seattle, as I said, at the University of Washington in the Department of Pediatrics. Alongside his career in medicine and research, he's invested a heap of time in developing easily accessible methods with which to track human health, performance and longevity. And what Tommy and I didn't go into detail with on this podcast, but I'm super interested in speaking to him about, is his work on blood biomarkers and what they mean in the athlete space. However, outside of that, Tommy and I really do a good kind of broad brush over health, longevity, wellness, insulin resistance, ancestral health, looking at health through an evolutionary lens, all into brain health and insulin resistance. Honestly, this is just a podcast all about uh, health and longevity. So those of you who are interested in any of that, which I imagine is most of you, would probably want to grab a pen and paper and be able to take notes or have a listen throughout and then come back and take some notes later. You can find all of the resources we discuss in the show notes as per usual. And then you can also find Tommy on social media, Instagram, Dr. Tommy Wood, and also over on his website, drragnar.com. Without further delay, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Tommy Wood. Dr. Tommy Woods, it's lovely to meet you. How are you this morning? Uh, you too, Mickey. Uh, um, I'm very well, thank you. In fact, I'm a day day behind you, you even. Are. Um, yes. But yeah, it's uh, it's great to be here, and I'm 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 super happy to come and talk to you on your relatively new podcast. Although I've seen from your previous guests that we have you've you've had lots of my friends on before, so so obviously this is right right up my street, which is great. Yeah, no, I no, I was thinking that actually that I've talked to a few of your mates and equally um, super excited to have you on, Tommy, as I was then, because you know a lot of smart people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, that's, I mean, one of the best things about being in this sphere, I think, is connecting with others who you can learn from, um, especially if you can develop good enough relationships that you can tell each other when you're wrong. Um, yes. So you can actually, so you can actually participate in the process of learning and getting better over time. Um, and there are far too many people, in my opinion, in the health sphere who are who already see themselves as the pinnacle, and they have people mm -hmm. underneath them, but nobody on the same level as them. Um, and I think that puts you at a real risk of uh, falling for your own uh, BS uh, uh, more than you'd want to. 
Um, yeah. So, so that's what's nice about having smart friends is I trust them to tell me when I'm wrong and or to, to learn from them. Yeah, and I was thinking actually about that because I was listening to your um, semi-recent, not really that recent, uh, podcasts with Paul Saladino. And, you know, he certainly does, um, uh, he kind of sits in that controversial space of, you know, all plants will kill you. And I did enjoy your conversation in and around, you know, plant polyphenols and that coffee will kill you and that you're frying your adenosine receptors in your brain <laughs> because you choose to have what I call as kind of black gold and the elixir of life, oh, yeah. uh, coffee. Um, but I really love that you can engage on that level with people who have a differing opinion, but it doesn't necessarily mean that either of you, oh, well, I mean, maybe one of you will be wrong, but you can at least appreciate <laughs> kind of what has kind of brought you to that position of, of where you sit on that realm of that particular topic. Yeah, um, Paul is a good friend of mine, and we don't agree on everything by any means. But uh, one thing that we have always had is is a is like a very supportive but also honest two way conversation. So if you know he thinks I'm wrong about something, he'll tell me, and we'll have a really good conversation about that, and and vice versa. So you know that doesn't mean that either of us necessarily changes our mind, but we're always open to to making sure we're getting as close as we can to what we think is correct. Yeah, and I think, you know, another thing which I have kind of recognized about you, Tommy, because I have listened to you over a number of years and read a lot of your blog posts and whatnot, is that you are not afraid to say when you're wrong and you're not afraid to change your mind. And, you know, I'm really interested to, in a couple of things that we'll discuss today, to uh, hear, you know, what you have changed your mind on and what might have kind of led you to taking a different position to what you may have thought two or three years ago. Obviously, the overarching answer to that is I've just learned more. But it's always interesting to kind of hear people's thought processes around that because, you know, we are exposed to so much information on a day to day basis. And it's that ability to recognize kind of what is um, relevant and what is, you know, potentially, um, well, not relevant and is just actually that white noise. First though, Tommy, you have a wealth of like letters after your name, PhD, MD, probably a whole host of other things. And I understand you have a background in biochemistry mm. um, as well. But you have that particular bent on ancestral health. And I'm always really interested to understand how people have kind of found themselves in that space. So what's been your journey there? Yeah, it's a great question. It's something that I found through CrossFit and Rob Wolf like oh, yeah. a decade ago. Um, yeah. And so it was probably during my undergrad, I was doing more sort of athletic training myself as a rower and then also more coaching. And also at that point was probably exercise addicted and was trying to find as many ways as possible I could, you know, flagellate myself in the gym and crossfit was just the perfect way to to do that um but back then crossfit and 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 rob were sort of closely aligned and that's when i first thought i think i you know i found his book uh, the paleo solution and listened to his podcast you know again this is what eight or nine years ago mm. and so that kind of got me into it and, or at least sort of first exposed me to the idea of you know sort of ancestral health uh, principles and then i went to medical school and sort of forgot about a lot of this stuff because I didn't have that much time uh, to, mm. to, to really think about it. But towards the end of medical school, I sort of got back into this by thinking about multiple sclerosis as a multifactorial disease. And this was kind of a, a family project because my stepbrother was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at the same age as me. And we kind of thought, you know, from a first principles approach, you know, can we just like go into the literature and say, well, we don't, well, like pretend we don't know anything what can we learn about all the different factors that m might be involved in multiple sclerosis? And what falls out is a lot to do with potential diet, chronic infections, to toxic exposures, uh, you know, vitamin D levels. Um, and so, again, that sort of ancestral health principle starts to come up because a lot of those things are intimately um, related. So that kind of brought me back to it. And then when I was a junior doctor in London, I signed up as what was then called the Paleo Physicians Network, which was set up by Rob Wolf again. I don't think it exists anymore. I think I, but I think I was the first physician in the UK sort of listed on there. And I wasn't like, you know, I was a junior doctor. I wasn't going to try and be anybody's physician sort of one-on-one, -on -one, but I was kind of there like, hey, 
I'm interested in this. You know, if I can answer any questions or just have discussions with people, you know, I've sort of put my name out there. Um, and then over time, when I started my PhD a few years later, I, you know, started my blog and podcast because I had a bit more time or my first podcast, a bit more time to, to sort of think about these things. Mm. And then I met at a, at a conference in the UK, I met a doctor called Polina Sayas, who's a sort of ancestral health based physician or it, you know, it was part of a society over here called the um, Physicians for Ancestral Health. And so she invited me to go over and speak to a conference that they had. It's like a small winter retreat. And then I met more ancestral health-minded physicians. I, became, I was president of the society uh, until a year or so ago, and I'm still sort of actively involved in that process. So it was kind of, yeah, you know, started out, you know, with sort of like the original, you know, R Rob Wolf, the OG, and then I kind of sort of went through and, and, and found that whole whole group which is largely based in the in the US but has really expect or you know really did expand across uh, Europe and the UK in the years after although now kind of paleo isn't a sexy word word anymore but you can just about get away with talking about ancestral health although it overlaps now with lifestyle medicine integrative mm. medicine functional medicine I think what works about all of those are, the, are these same sort of the, the same core principles even though those different worlds like to argue each other which is a waste of time in my mind but they're, they're sort of all underpinned by the same ideas I think yeah do you know I feel a little bit sad that we can't say paleo anymore I don't know why <laughs> but I feel like, like oh, it's just kind of saddens me maybe it'll come back around and we'll like own it um do you want to talk me through those principles, Tommy? And I, obviously they're well-oiled ground for you and a lot of people that will be listening will be familiar, but some might not. Yes. So it's basically the audacious thought that the world that we evolved in is one that should inform what is required to make us as, as healthy as possible. And so if you're going to boil down those principles, I think they are movement, sleep and circadian rhythm, so light during the day, darkness at night, good high quality food um some kind of stress mitigating practice and that could be prayer or mindfulness or meditation or something like that some kind of sort of connection with with the, with the greater world and then social interaction so you mm. know actually physically interacting with other people contributing to something larger than yourself what you might call mm. uh eudaimonic pleasure so like deriving uh, meaning and purpose from contributing to something greater than than yourself because we used to be you know we evolved as part of tribes as tribal groups and everybody had their place they had their thing to do it gave, gave them meaning and purpose and when we lack those in in modern society which is sadly quite common then that's also associated with various um health disorders and, and sort of chronic health decline so all of those things i think are very important uh, for our long-term health and those those in my mind really form the basis of ancestral health Mm. And you're um, obviously, because your introduction to this was cross, CrossFit, you kind of, that almost comes really made with a tribe of people who will feel and, you know, share similar kind of beliefs. Um, what is it like for you now with regards to, not, um, are you still in CrossFit? I'm not sure. Uh, no, so I, the, my main CrossFit practice actually happened when I was a, a junior doctor. So what well, we're talking like tw 2011 to 2013, maybe. Um, although I still feel, you know, connected to, to those groups because you're right, as, as a methodology, I think it, it, it takes things to extremes and it mm. um, appeals to people who like to take things to extremes. But still, like, you know, I'll watch the CrossFit Games every year because it's just this insane expression of human fitness and, mm. and technical skill combined, which is, is difficult to, to, to see elsewhere. But obviously it had its sort of culty downsides and all the all the neon uh, clothing and, you know, people, you know, it's like, every, you know, it's, it's like, you know, you make those memes about, you know, people who are vegans only talk about being vegans and people yeah, who are yeah. CrossFitters only talk about being CrossFitters. And I, and I certainly understand the downsides of that. But you're right, that, that kind of uh, group mentality and support, I think, is, is really important. And it's helped, you know, thousands of people, I think, as part of CrossFit. But, you know, it's the same thing as, people who are you know, part of some religious group or a church or something, you, you'll, you'll get that same kind of social support. So if, if that's you know, how, you, how, how you get it and how you feel supported, I think that's, that's, that's really, really important. Um, mm. And actually in 2011, I was in the US, it was right at the end of medical school, and I came on elected to the US and I was in three or four different cities. And the first thing I did is I went to the local CrossFit gym and then basically within two hours, I had 10 friends and we'd go out for dinner, <laughs> yeah. you know, we'd work out and then we'd go out and have burgers and maybe a beer. 
Um, and so immediately I had like a ready-made friendship group just, just through yeah. that process. So, so I, I think there's a huge amount of benefit to, to that kind of thing. Yeah. And so now with the kind of people that you surround yourself in at work and in stuff in Seattle itself, like what kind of movement or um, interest is there in some of these principles in the ancestral health? Is it difficult to find like-minded people? I mean, it, it kind of, it kind of depends. Most of my connections into the ancestral health world are not local. They are, you know, spread throughout the world and uh, online. Certainly, a lot of those things have proponents in, I think, most major cities, if not throughout throughout the U.S. You know, and people have adopted these different practices as part of their own. And again, they might call it something else, uh, but mm. I think they are. You know, it's very common in various um, alternative uh, medical practices, and actually, you know, even creeping into allopathic medicine as well. You know, the importance of sleep and movement and these other things are starting to come in as well which, which i think is great in, in terms of like my workout practices I, I now i'm fortunate enough to have my own pretty well stocked gym at home so it's just me and my barbells by myself and sometimes the dogs come and say hello so it, it doesn't have that quite that same um, camaraderie but in the past year when a lot of people haven't been able to go and, and work out in gyms then you know i've been lucky to be able to, to keep doing that so you know pros and cons yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Tommy, you mentioned like the importance of a high quality diet and and I'm really interested just to get your perspective on where the guidelines get it wrong. You know, and New Zealand and obviously we, we live in different countries and um you're from and I don't know are you from Britain or do you just grew up in Britain and you've got some Norwegian background? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> well, so I was actually born in the US. Um my mum is Icelandic, my dad is English, so I have triple nationality. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah, I, spent, I grew up mainly in the UK. I lived in the UK from when I was five until I moved to Norway uh, for my PhD in 2013. So I was there from, from the UK from 1989 to 2013. So, so most of my life. Um, and then I've been in the US since 2016. Okay, so and does I mean, it doesn't really matter what Western country you're sort of in, the the guidelines are not that different. Mm. Um, where do they get it wrong, in your opinion? Where where they get it wrong in my mind is basically focusing on macronutrients and total calories at the expense of of everything else. Mm. And you know, and even within certain macronutrients, like particularly. Um, fat, you know, specifying a certain percentage threshold for saturated fat, like 10% of calories. Um, and the reason why I think that's important is, right, total calories and total caloric intake is, and net caloric balance is what drives our weight, right? I mean, mm. I don't think, it, the, you know, I don't think anybody um, serious would um, argue with that. However, the food itself can dictate how much of it you eat um, and it can also dictate the downstream physiology so when we process foods and like there are, there are some people who don't like the word food processing because technically when i cook my steak i have processed my food and, and obviously I, I don't mean that uh, what i mean is when i take a grain and i completely you know separate it from its constituent parts and grind it down into a you know into a fine flour and you know, I take away the fiber and the, any of the aspect of the grain that had any nu nutrients in it. And it's the same if I take oils. You take a plant and you find the small amount of oil that's in there and you highly refine it so that you can get your sunflower seed oil or your you know, canola oil, rapeseed oil, mm. soybean oil. When you do that, what you do is you, dive, is you separate out the normal physiological response to that type of food and those calories and those macronutrients mm. from what the body expects. So with highly refined proteins or highly refined carbohydrates, highly refined fats, you get very different and much larger exaggerated physiological responses like uh, blood sugar, insulin, to that given food for the given amount of the macronutrient that is in that food. So basically, we get to a point where our bodies can't regulate food intake as well because the signals have been distorted by the way the food has been processed. Mm. And, and I think that's where... The, the guidelines get it wrong because if we you know we we've seen in general that if you have very calorie dense foods which you basically can only get by refining them and processing them then we become less good at maintaining or regulating our caloric intake our caloric balance so if we were to just focus on foods in their more natural unprocessed state 
and we also at the same time slept and you know had a little bit of um you know stress mitigation and we moved all of those things improve our ability to regulate our appetite mm. and so then the, the problem kind of takes care of itself yeah in my mind and you don't really need to think about it but it, re- it requires both and, and and so you can overcome this right you can calorie count and you can macro count and you can kind of brute force your way into it and, mm. and a lot of people do that and, and they enjoy it and it gives them a feeling of self-efficacy and you know improves their health and that's great but you know at a sort of macro level if you want to regulate appetite and body composition and, and performance you know without having to do that then i think all of those things are required to a certain extent so so high food quality with a high nutrient density and, and uh, lower caloric density you know, a ribeye steak is relatively calorically dense. We're never going to get around that. And then, then some of the, some of these other things that are required for normal society signaling. So, you know, have, being well rested and you know some kind of frequent movement and those kinds of things, which then also affects our our uh, our intakes. Mm. That's such a good description of kind of some of the things which I also recognise as real problems with like the modern food supply. And you bring up a point which I haven't really talked with anyone before about, but I know that you've had extensive conversations with others, and that's the idea of the industrial seed oils and the liquid oils. Mm. Um, Because, you know, these are polyunsaturated fats with which we are recommended that if we're going to choose any type of fat, it should be a polyunsaturated over a saturated fat without any distinction between where we get that polyunsaturated fat from, like whether or not you get it from nut, like the whole nut, mm. or you actually are having an oil. Can you describe maybe some of the the issues in and around those liquid oils? Yeah, and, and so, so this is actually something where I probably held a stronger belief previously than I do now, but, but context dependently, which mm. we can go into. Um, so... These, in, in general, you know, we're talking about these liquid vegetable oils. And so, like I said, sunflower oil, um, rapeseed or canola oil, as they call it in the US, soybean oil. Um, safflower oil was, was popular for our corn oil. Like, never seen oily corn. I have no idea where they find it. But um, <laughs> so, so these, these, these are highly refined oils where you've kind of had to really extract out every, every ounce of the tiny amount of fat that, that are in these foods. Um, and there is one particular fatty acid that, really dominates in these oils except so sunflower oil i think is the least problematic of all of them because it has the Mm. lowest content of linoleic acid which is this omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid and when we are like particularly when we're using these to fry things uh, in their highly refined state so the the hotter you heat them and the more cycles you heat and cool them as is common in a fast food fryer Mm. then you get uh, a lot of what we call peroxidized they're basically damaged by free radicals mm. so these peroxidized lipids that then i mean they have a, a number of potential harmful effects in terms of inflammatory signaling um and you know causing oxidative stress in our bodies as well um and so and they you know they can even damage some of the proteins in the foods so that that kind of thing I, I, you know I, it's very difficult to justify eating fried foods you know if you have it occasionally i have no like last night it was my wife's birthday. We went out. I had a big ribeye and I had some fries. Right. Delicious. Those fries, I think, had probably zero effect on my long-term health because the, con- you know, the whole context is much more important. But yeah, yeah. I don't think these should make up a, you know, a, a, a big part of our diets. And so that's particularly heated, industrial, fry, you know, heated and cooled multiple times, fast food type. If you, if you have the, the oils in their less refined state, so rapeseed like extra virgin rapeseed oil is kind of a, a sexy thing in the uk mm. and it maybe is in new zealand too mm. uh, less so in the us uh, but you know equally with olive oils avocado oils they have a much higher vitamin e content to cofrol content and so that actually protects them from some of these oxidative um stress issues so, so that's those can be beneficial so again like context is is important when we think about what might then happen when we have a lot of these fats in the body mm. I used to be particularly concerned, but basically that it was bad for everything. Um, and certainly some of the downstream metabolites of linoleic acid do seem to interfere with other important uh, pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory signaling molecules in the body. Um, and I think that is still important in certain contexts. When you're thinking about, say, heart, say heart disease, mm. if you know, the studies where we have them, 
measuring how much some how much intake of any one food somebody has and then looking at their long-term health outcomes is basically impossible mm. right we've tried this with nutritional epidemiology you ask people questionnaires and then they tell you what they eat and they lie mm. um, or they don't remember properly mm. however if i measure the amount of linoleic acid content in your fat that's probably a good indicator of how much you ate because most of the fat on your body is fat that you ate yeah interesting and so if we look at linoleic acid contents of body fat so this is one study done in sweden people who had higher linoleic acid contents actually had a lower risk of, of dying from heart disease. Which, if you think that these are like pro-inflammatory, absolutely terrible things for you, that's counterintuitive. So, I, so, so in that setting, with the best possible data, it's, it's really hard for me to say linoleic acid definitely causes heart disease, which some yeah. people would say. There was also a really interesting study, again done in Sweden, actually, where they did, they did an overfeeding protocol in young, relatively fit, I think it was men only. And what they did is they gave them, they overfed them muffins. So a, mm. a certain number of calories as muffins. And they sort of, then they regulated body weight. So they always wanted to make sure they were in the same positive balance. And those muffins either had a load of fat from saturated fat or a load of fat from linoleic acid. And interestingly, the ones who were overfed with a linoleic acid gained less adipose tissue and more lean mass compared to the ones who were overfed with saturated fat. Um, and like in my world, the more lean mass you have, the better, really. Totally. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so, so both of those things made me think, well, hang on a second. Maybe this isn't all bad. Mm. And, and that's just, that's just where we are with the current state of the science. None of these studies are really great to answer the questions and concerns that some people have about these vegetable oils, but you know, they kind of say maybe the signal isn't as, as detrimental as we thought. Yeah. However, I obviously am a neuroscientist and I spend most of my time studying the brain. Yes. And in the developing brain, and we've seen this in animal models, we've seen it in humans uh, or infants fed, you know, either breast milk or, you know, soy based formula, and then died from something else. But then we did an, aut they did an autopsy and looked at the fats in the brain. Mm. What it looks like is that if you have a very high linoleic acid content or intake as a baby, um, and, and linoleic acid has increased sort of three to four fold in breast milk over mm. the last few decades, again, because it's increased in a similar amount in the diet and a lot of the fat that ends up in the breast milk is, is fat from the diet and so babies are being exposed to a lot more linoleic acid through breast milk and in you know particularly in the absence of a significant amount of omega-3s mm. linoleic acid seems to outcompete the omega-3s and reduce their their uptake into the brain and yeah. like dha which is sort of the long chain omega-3 is absolutely critical for normal brain development and normal brain function mm. and also for creating the right signaling metabolites to help reduce inflammation in the setting of a brain injury mm. so particularly in the developing brain and in people at risk of brain injury i have concern that a diet that's very high in linoleic acid particularly in the absence of adequate omega-3s long chain mm. omega-3s mm. is going to then um you know is, is going to detrimentally affect either the development of the brain in the first place or increase the susceptibility to injury. So for the peripheral body, I think I'm less worried than maybe I was previously, but I'm st mm. I still have significant concerns about the brain, particularly the developing brain. So with regards to the developing brain, do we have any kind of signal or, or any information to suggest what the long-term impact is of that, Tommy? Like particularly because, of course, you know, you've got a whole bunch of mothers breastfeeding in this situation who wouldn't mm. be so familiar with this so what's what are we thinking yeah it, it's a good question and and sort of at a population level I, I don't think we we necessarily really know you know we can see sort of individual data a baby um you know so again so from this autopsy data if this ba this baby was fed formula where mm. almost all of the fat came from linoleic acid mm. and then that's the fat that makes up the brain. Whereas mm. we know that D and there's not very much DHA. And DHA accumulates, particularly in the last, in the third trimester. And it's incredibly important for normal synaptic function, um, you know, those, maintaining those normal connections. And actually also for normal mitochondrial function, because it sort of accumulates, particularly in the, in the mitochondria of, of neurons. So at a, you know, a large scale level, nobody's really been able to figure out what this increase in exposure in the population is doing but sort of individually we think it's it has it definitely changes the, the the fat composition of the brain which is otherwise very tightly regulated um so if you know so i can't and and the, the problem is then in this setting 
there have been a number of studies, as, as is with many diseases, there have been a number of studies trying to give extra omega-3s to babies at risk. So babies are at risk of premature birth. And so if you give omega-3s to women who are at risk of having a premature birth, you can actually decrease that risk. So that certainly seems to be beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're looking at neurodevelopmental outcomes in babies who are either born prematurely or for some other reason they were, took part in a trial where they were given omega-3s, uh, to try and improve you know, brain development long term, brain function, cognitive function. We don't really see much benefit. Um, and my hypothesis is that when you look at, so when, you, when you're giving these supplements, they're off, you know, if it's part of a formula or, you know, if, if you look at the ratio of the omega 3s being given to the omega 6s that are also there, um, I, th I think there's still such a massive imbalance that even adding more omega 3s doesn't, it isn't going to be enough to overcome. Or the omega sixes that that are there. So, I mean, this all sounds kind of scary, but like the simple heuristic is that if you reduce like processed and refined foods, fried foods, you know, processed foods that have you know a, a lot of you know oil in them, or you know the fat has come from these kind of processed seed oils, just just eliminating those from the diet basically fixes all the problems in yeah. my mind. Um, yeah. So so it's kind of there's there's loads of bits of evidence that you have to piece together but the, the sort of the downstream answer if if you're somebody who's able to make these kinds of changes to your diet is is a fairly simple one yeah so interesting isn't it because that linoleic acid is a sign of it's, it's often it's packaged in with the starch and the the mm. sugar and it's the additives and preservatives and it's the food that the food that people are eating so it is a very good you know you're right if you try to make moves to reduce that then by virtue you should be improving the quality of your of your diet I know you can't speak to this but isn't it interesting because of course children you know I'm thinking back to when I was a kid I actually don't I think I was breastfed but I might not have been like back in the 70s and kind of early 80s formula was all the rage actually it was yeah. like sweet boom don't have to worry about being attached to your infant 24 7 and then of course if I think 10 years kind of down the track obviously diagnostic tools for children who have problems learning and difficulties at school are probably better now so more and more children are being diagnosed with potential learning difficulties and what you're talking about with the brain and just the importance of those inputs in that kind of prenatal setting like is it too much of a stretch to suggest there might be a link there even if we can't possibly determine one way or the other yeah so, so you're right. Linoleic acid intake is a very nice marker of processed foods, mm. right? So, so, may, so maybe it's not the linoleic acid. Maybe it's the other things, you know, the processed starches or other things that are coming with it. Or maybe it's all of them. Um, and so as these intakes have increased, you know, we've also seen obesity increase. And with, the, you know, an increase in adiposity comes an increased risk of type diabetes, which you're seeing uh, increase as well. And, you know, obviously you mentioned um, either some kind of We'll, we'll say neurodivergence. So people become, you know, an increase in diagnosis of people who are non-neurotypical uh, for, for whatever reason, which, you know, there's, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It's just what, what has been, what is becoming more prevalent, or at least we're seeing more of it. And again, it could just be because people are looking in different and better ways. And, you know, all these things have increased over the last four to five decades. And, and are they linked? It's impossible to, to tell, really. There's, Definitely, like the the quality of formula has certainly improved, mm. um, you know, recently. And there's been, you know, more of a focus of including medium and chain triglycerides, which would then get converted into ketones, which are very important for the developing brain. So, I think, you know, obviously, you know, breast milk has its certain benefits, but not everybody is able is is able to breastfeed. Mm. And I think the quality of of breast milk and the the research of like particularly of the fatty acid content that's important for the developing brain um, and how that's being turned, you know, to used to create better formulas i, I think is is pretty good because you mm. know not everybody can breastfeed so i think that's mm. important you know, somebody some people are formula fed and i think we're now at a point where that is much better understood and the quality of the formula is much better so you know we can only learn over time and where you know breastfeeding may have certain benefits i think the 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 quality of the formula is certainly improved as well so so i think that all of that's good yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And it's interesting on the whole brain thing because obviously, like in New Zealand, we're an aging population, and it might be the same worldwide. Whether mm -hmm. you know, where people are living longer, not necessarily in in better health. And you know, I have friends whose grandparents 
died of Alzheimer's, whose parents might be showing early signs of dementia. And then on, on the other side, you've got more and more research coming out to show the nutrients and the things which are important for brain health and, and for protecting against these neurodegenerative diseases. But then you've got Dale Bredenson's 36-point plan, mm. you know, which for some people seems it's just almost overwhelming for them, Tommy, as mm. to, you know, what on earth they can do to help support their brain health. And often in that kind of overwhelm, people just, you know, throw up their hands, can't be bothered. What's the point? Absolutely, yeah. What are the important things? Obviously, you've mentioned DHA as an omega-3 fatty acid. What are other things which we know can help support healthy brains as we age? I am you know, fairly in awe of what Dale Bredesen has been able to do in terms of bringing to the forefront all the different things and lifestyle factors, environmental factors that can affect long-term Alzheimer's disease risk. However, if you did want to do everything that he recommends, you would have to spend thousands of dollars on testing plus thousands of dollars on supplements and be engaged in eight different kinds of brain training and all kinds of imaging and all this kind of stuff. And like the vast majority of people just can't do that. There's and one you know, person that can, and he's awesome, Ben Greenfield. I bet you he could fit it in. <laughs> <laughs> he I'm must sure. have about, about 50 hours in his day. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a certain type of person who, who can do that, and that is not, but it is not most people. Mm. Um, we'll put it that way. So I think the, the things that are important, essentially the same throughout uh, the entire lifespan. And so if we look at uh, risk factors for either an earlier death or diagnosis of what we'll call age-related dementia or age-related cognitive decline, because I think they are separate from true Alzheimer's disease, which is largely genetic and early onset. So DHA, I, I think, is important. I'm in the process with a colleague of mine, uh, Rory Heath, of writing a paper about DHA status in Alzheimer's disease and whether we can really me you know, measure that and understand that. And in reality, we understand that system much less well than we like to think we do. And it's really hard to figure out the true connection there. But, but we know that DHA is important for the brain. So just like getting some is probably going to be important. But actually our adipose, for most people who have had intakes of DHA throughout their life, your adipose tissue can store maybe up to 10 years worth of DHA. Oh, um, wow. As, and you know, one of the reasons we have adipose tissue as a species is to support brain function. Mm. And so as a reservoir of DHA is one of those reasons. Uh, I think uh, minimizing uh, glucose fluctuations and maintaining good metabolic health. Um, and th that's been shown to be reversible. So if, if you look at studies where they looked at cognitive function in trials where they improved glycemic variability or um, you know glycemia in people with type 2 diabetes those who had the best improvements in glycemic function or glycemic variability had that had actually improvements in their cognitive function so it's not too late to do that you can still improve that once you know you have type 2 diabetes or you have some kind of cognitive decline um, sleep is obviously incredibly important both quality and quantity stress um but it seems like stress in situations where you have little control so if you are an executive high functioning or a, or a lawyer you have a stressful job but you have a lot of control mm. in those settings as much as we understand from the research that doesn't seem to be associated with an increased risk of dementia or cognitive decline but if you're on somebody with a high stress job where you have little control that does seem to be associated with an increased risk. That is so interesting because I talk to a lot of people and I'm sure you know a lot of people who you could classify as that type A stimulated by stress. That's how they thrive and that's really mm. where they shine. So stress is just this major part of their kind of makeup and that high stress environment. So are you saying, Tommy, that someone in that instance, because they are largely in control of their job or their life or whatever it is that they're working with, they will be less impacted by the negative impact outcomes of stress compared to, say, someone who is working 50 hours a week on a, you know, an, an hourly rate, rate and they can't control when they get their mm. breaks and their work hours and things like that. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's what the evidence seems to suggest. The, the one ca potential caveat is that the higher somebody functions to begin with, the better they are at getting around when their function declines yeah. and so particularly when if you're thinking about the way that we diagnose cognitive decline obviously there's a standardized test mm. if somebody functioned well above the average generally in whatever metrics that are being measured in that test they would have to lose a lot of function before it's picked up mm. um, and, and i think a lot of people who are in you know sort of those those jobs 
high stress, high control jobs would probably fit. They would often fit into that category. Uh, that's just that's just one sort of one caveat that's worth bearing in mind. Mm, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I interrupted you with with what you were saying. So then, one one thing we haven't talked about is movement and body composition. So frequent movement, um, and actually uh, a trial was a trial in over sixty fives. Uh, doing brisk walking three times a week for 40 minutes relative to, a yo- I think it was a yoga or stretching control. Those who did the brisk walking, um, that was the first time we saw an increase in size of the hippocampus, which is the area of the brain most associated with memory and is, you know, is quite selectively or actively damaged in, uh, in cognitive decline or dementia mm, or mm. certain dementias, Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, actually, those, that, that part of the hippocampus grew in size in, in those who were doing um the, the brisk walking and and wow. we've seen similar uh, yeah so 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 movement certainly seems to be associated with improved cognitive function uh resistance training seems to be improved uh, associated with improved connectivity in the white matter so that's like the bit in the middle of our brain where all the you know fast relays are made uh so both aerobic and resistance training seems to be important and that can be a direct effect but also could work through body composition. So people with more excess adipose tissue uh, seem to have thinner gray matter uh, in the brain, again, on average. Uh, and those with more muscle tissue also seem to have some better metrics of, of cognitive function. So muscle tissue is, like, is, is, a, is a fabulous metabolic buffer. So again, that's going to help smooth out blood sugar variations and uh, blood sugar regulation. But also, it's going to improve systemic inflammation. And obviously, that's associated with, with cognitive cognitive decline so there's multiple reasons why movement uh is associated with better brain function yeah so interesting isn't it i had a chat to dr stuart gray from university of glasgow and we talked about the importance of omega-3s with regards to muscle function and and Mm. muscle aging and and which i know is separate from the brain but obviously we were speaking on omega-3s so it's sort of a tangent sort of related and he was describing that you know there's been studies now to show that healthy individuals or healthy older adults who do not do any exercise can still maintain their muscle mass over you know a certain period of time because they're taking a certain amount of omega threes, um, omega three fatty acids, which is quite remarkable really, just given that as we age, there's this natural decline in muscle mass just by virtue of being older, you know, and that you know no resistance training, but they were able to support their muscle mass. I found quite interesting, particularly of course because you may have a cohort of people who cannot be active when they're older mm. for for various reasons. I'm all for resistance training. I'm an endurance athlete. However, you talk about that addictive nature of CrossFit. I I own my addiction to endurance <laughs> exercise, um, but I'm also very aware and uh, of the importance of resistance training and and do that also protein is such a huge component of everything that we're talking about mm-hmm. right and it's such a an overlooked component if we're thinking about the dietary guidelines and potential recommendations but also older adults as well I think have a real particular requirement for that increased protein intake at each meal yet of course there's that, um, you know, appetites tend to be lower when people are older. Um, access to good quality sources of protein are maybe a little bit compromised for some people. That can be a tricky one for sure. Yeah, one of the sort of critical underlying components of aging is some kind of systemic heightened inflammatory response, some kind of, you know, um, setting of chronic inflammation. And, you know, there have been some studies looking at centenarians and supercentenarians and looking at, you know, what what's the sort of the... The, the metabolic signal associated with, you know, with those who live a very long time. And, it's, and the, the one sort of uh, thing that, that ties them all together is usually low levels of, of chronic inflammation. And so, but these things normally increase over time as we age. And so that's associated with what we call anabolic resistance. So like an inability or, or a decreased ability to replace muscle tissue because you know, these things are constantly being broken down and regenerated. And we sort of end up net catabolic as we get older because of Mm. that and so omega-3s can certainly improve inflammatory signaling and so they may be having it you know through through that mechanism like improve helping to improve the maintenance of muscle mass but then also protein incredibly important and protein intake uh, or protein requirements you know the more we look at this certainly seem to be increased uh, Mm. as we get older because it's the uh, the availability of amino acids is sort of the main 
you know, as well as providing some kind of mechanical stimulus that, you know, is, is the main stimulus to, to synthesizing new or maintaining uh, muscle tissue. Mm, so interesting. And it's unfortunate that dietary guidelines don't really reflect increased requirements. They're there for minimal survival and nothing to do with kind of optimal aging or optimal health really through, through life cycle. There's still um, a huge sort of anti-protein movement, particularly from those who are who have a plant-based bent, uh, and there are some some really pretty terrible, <laughs> notorious and well-publicized uh, papers that suggest that increased protein intake, particularly earlier in life, is associated with increased cancer and increased risk of death, and it's because you've got higher IGF-1. And you know, if you actually dig into the data, I can fairly confidently say that's complete nonsense. Uh, mm. But that stuff does get does get some some press and and scares people into not eating protein when in, in reality if you sort of if you have a, a good protein intake and you base and you solve your uh diet dietary intake for to like to optimize th- that protein intake like the quality almost immediately improves uh, because mm. you just you can't fit in these sort of highly processed calorie dense foods because they don't contain a lot of protein yeah, and you're so right. Like people, I've heard you say this, and I am not in an agreement to myself because I was listening on a podcast that you know people like to live in the extremes. the The vegan diet is an extreme. Someone might consider CrossFit six times a week extreme. I would consider CrossFit six times a week extreme. <laughs> yeah. um, but, but equally, you've got your your carnivore approach, and a lot of people believe that that plants are actually out to kill us. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in your discussion in and around coffee with Paul Saladino on on his podcast. Um, And I... And the idea that, you know, the, the polyphenols in coffee are actually really harmful for health, yet that kind of flies in the face of, yes, it's nutrition epidemiology, but this other idea that actually, you know, four to five cups a day may be associated with better health outcomes with regards to metabolic health. Like, how do those two exist side by side? And particularly because Paul Saladino, a mate of yours, he is not a dumb guy. Like, you know, he's certainly smart. So how do you negotiate or go around those conversations, dear Tommy? Yes. So talk, talk, talk to me. So I, I will say that there is almost no strong signal in any study that coffee is in any way bad for our health. <laughs> and, and obviously, I have to say that as a personal bias because I, I enjoy drinking coffee now. Yeah. Um, and so this includes, the, and obviously a lot of this comes from nutritional epidemiology. Um, mm. If you want to give very high levels of refined coffee constituents to rats and try mm. and tell me something about human health, mm. you know, I am a rat scientist by trade. Yes. It's going to take a lot for you to convince me that that's important. And, and most of those studies don't get me excited at all. So we've talked about nutritional epidemiology being a problem for what people eat. I think the data is probably a bit better for caffeine intake because it is is so associated with like strong habits. Like I can tell you how much coffee I drink. I can't tell you how much steak I eat or how many potatoes I eat or how many bananas I ate in the past year. But I can tell you how often I drank coffee because it's the same every day. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, I think the, the quality of the data for coffee is certainly much better. And there is no strong signal pretty much for any outcome. And if there is any signal, it, it is positive. So yeah. I don't tell people to drink coffee because it'll improve their health. But I am fairly confident that it's not detrimental. Um, yeah. In general... I think the 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 carnival movement is, is is very interesting, and certainly a lot of people. You know, it's kind of the most extreme, and I don't mean extreme in a bad way. I just mean sort of in terms of narrowing down food choices. It is the most extreme version of an elimination diet, which in general, I am you know I'm very in favour of elimination diets for various rheumatological conditions. And actually, in the 60s and 70s, uh, a, a sort of an iterative elimination diet was was basically standard of care in rheumatology before we developed. Uh, a monoclonal antibodies against or various immunosuppressants um, and so I, I think that still you know has, has an important place in clinical practice hmm. um, though you know you sh- it, it's it's not necessarily a long-term solution you should sort of iterate to find what works best for you and then move around that as needed there's certainly benefit there i find it very difficult to believe that humans are actively poisoned by plants in a negative manner you know such that it continuously detrimentally affects our health and the reason for that is that humans eat a lot of plants um and have done for a long period of time and there's you know even if they were a fallback food when animal foods weren't readily available we adapted to be able to consume them 
and thrive whilst doing that because if if sort of our, our health fell apart every time we had to resort to plant foods we wouldn't then be able to go out and hunt the next big animal mm -hmm. or you know migrate and survive so my personal bias is that if you don't react well to any plant foods is that's a signal that something else is still not right you know and it could be maybe maybe it's dietary related mm -hmm. uh, but it could be related to all those other things that we talked about and i certainly mm -hmm. have seen the more people neglect other aspects of their environment and lifestyle the more they need to hyper focus on, on another one so you need to be more restrictive in your diet because you're not thinking about stress and sleep and social interaction and maybe envi other environmental exposures mm. um so that's that's kind of how i th i think about it and so it's it, it can be important for some people to take out plant foods or animal foods it can go the other way mm. uh, but if it's a really strong reaction to like this wide variety of things that we are fairly well adapted to eating i think it's a signal that something else still needs to be fixed yes there was something else that i was gonna say but i've forgotten okay that's such a good um synopsis of kind of where you sit on it and look you know i you know i have clients who have done a carnivore approach particularly for the reason that you've described. Something's going on in their gut, we're not sure, and more than just their gut, there's a whole host of things, and they are trying to work on those other lifestyle factors, but actually diet is one of the things that you can control, because mm. it's really difficult to control the environment around you, the relationships that you have, the stresses at work, or at least feel like you can control them, whereas if you can hyper-focus on the diet and that can improve like a lot of what's going on then then that's great the interesting thing is is the the glucose levels of people who who go carnivore i've seen reported from a few people just um and this is not um, a personal interaction but just on the interwebs that mm. you know everything is absolutely stellar but high fasting glucose or high trending glucose do you know what's going on there tommy i just assume that someone like you is gonna have some ideas <laughs> yeah so th there's a lot of discussion back and forth on this and some people think that it's some degree of physiological insulin resistance which you will oh, see yeah. when you restrict all carbohydrates from the diet mm. um and so uh fasting blood sugar does see like does potentially increase um in these people but what you eliminate is any glycemic variability um, and and one of the you know things that we've really focused in on is the amplitude of glycemic excursions. So one thing you might see in the literature is called the MAGE, the mean amplitude of glycemic excursions. And basically, the bigger the spikes on average, that seems to be associated with a more dangerous coronary artery plaque or worse cognitive function. Um, and certainly, that worsens as you become more insulin resistant and, and towards type two diabetes. So if we look at, again, at epidemiological studies, the best place to be in terms of your fasting blood sugar is probably around uh, 90 milligrams of deciliter or five millimolar, mm. you know, somewhere, around, somewhere around there, you know, plus or minus, 10% uh, maybe. And above that, we, we see an increase in risk of cardiovascular disease or cause mortality. Um, however, that's in the setting of people eating a mixed diet which will include some glycemic excursions. And obviously, the higher your fasting blood sugar in, in that population, the bigger your glycemic excursions. So is it the yeah. fasting glucose or is it the size of your excursions? And so if you go on a carnivore diet and your fasting blood sugar goes up, but at the same time, your excursions have gone down, mm. you know, do those things balance out? And my guess is they probably do. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. But, we don't, but we honestly don't know. Yeah, interesting. And do we have any idea of what's going on in the background with insulin as well? That seems to be that's the one thing that we never really have a clue about when we have a look at, you know, even those excursions or look at HbA1c or blood sugar control across the course of the day. We don't know what's going on in the background as to how much insulin's being pumped mm. out to support that glycemic control. And so in, in that group, I think, you know, and particularly people who eat a very low carbohydrate diets for long periods of time they, they generally have much lower levels of insulin mm, um mm. and and actually less insulin variability as well as, uh, as you might expect and if you were to then give that person an oral glucose tolerance test you just like dump a load of glucose into the system they will get a huge spike in glucose uh, because partly because their their tissues are sort of selectively glucose resistant for want of mm. a better word at that time to try and direct glucose mainly for the reserve glucose for the brain mm. but also because their their insulin system isn't isn't ready so mm. actually they won't release enough insulin to deal with that and that's part of the reason why why you get a big spike but if they're otherwise metabolically healthy if they ate carbohydrates for a few days the system would come back 
online. It's just yeah, it's, yeah. it's a different it's a it's a different type of metabolism based on on what you're eating, and the, and the body adapts just fine. Um, so in those goes, you would expect lower insulin uh, in general, but then you will have big glycemic variability if you just suddenly you know dump a load of glucose into the system. Yeah, so interesting. Like with all your knowledge, Tommy, I'm really interested to know what kind of diet do you eat. So I eat something that approximates uh, some kind of paleo mm-hmm. diet. Mm-hmm. I don't particularly like I don't religiously exclude grains but I don't eat them very frequently like I might we may eat rice once a week um occasionally my wife will bake something and I'm not in a position to have to avoid it although Mm -hmm. you know I certainly would if if my health was you know would benefit from it um so it's generally high protein I probably at least a gram per kilo uh per day of protein Mm. obviously lots of vegetables particularly with the evening meal so during the day I'll, I'll probably eat like more more meat and, and fish and it's generally leftovers actually but yeah so meat fish vegetables uh, you know potatoes occasionally fruit not a huge amount of ref, uh, refined uh, refined grains or refined fats so so basically kind of what i find a pragmatic approach to all the things that we've discussed so yeah that's how i eat in general but you know like i said i'll occasionally have fries or whatever and and because of the general context of my diet i don't worry about it Okay, so I've been in Seattle. I know the craft beer scene is pretty good. Are you a craft beer man? I do like a good IPA. I've got to got to admit, um, it's not something I don't drink alcohol very frequently. Mm. Um, maybe once every, maybe once a fortnight. Yeah, um, yeah. But and again, then it, it's a maximum one or two drinks, and just yeah. just because I I enjoy the flavor rather than. You know, going back to my teenage years where it was, you know, <laughs> much, much more, uh, certainly not in moderation. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, Tommy, outside of the, so obviously, so you just told me your diet, you don't really drink a lot of alcohol. Is there anything that, you know, sometimes, no, I mean, knowledge is power, but sometimes it's a real bummer as well, because you then, you know, you, like, <laughs> I can never look at, this sounds disgusting, but I used to love that surimi, that fake crab meat, like when I was growing up, I don't know why, uh, yeah. but I really loved it, and then I was mm. just, like, I can't look at it now, and I could never bring myself to eat it, even though I'm not, you know, I, I, I follow a minimally processed approach to diet, but certainly, you know, there are things that I eat, which um, you probably wouldn't go near with a barge pole, um, um, anything in that realm that you just you could never eat but you would probably quite like do you know what honest honestly uh no I, I i don't think so my general philosophy is that you can and should control mm. the things that you can and then beyond that don't worry about it so 99 percent of what i eat is yeah cooked by me from scratch from whole ingredients from high quality foods high quality animal foods plant foods then if I wanted some crab sticks occasionally or there's there's a cookie and it looks good and even if it what well, it's not organic flour and there's probably going to be some glyphosate on it because you know I just uh, I just don't worry about it because I'm I'm fairly certain that the worry about the food itself is going to be more detrimental to my health than yeah, yeah. that cookie is so that's pretty much how I approach it a lot of people um I've been accused many times of making food not fun because when i talk about like all the different things these different foods can do to your body then like people become sort of hyper focused or hyper worried about certain things so i hope to at the same time say if, if you make these broad scale changes if, if that's something that you're able to, to do and, and not everybody is right mm. it's, it's a real privilege to be able to talk about the high quality food that we can choose to eat and, and certainly probably the majority of people, the people can't do that but if you can do that then it's also important just to remember that you're all, you know, you've already made such a vast difference to your health that these other small things happening occasionally aren't really gonna aren't really gonna move the needle. Yeah, to yeah. I've always thought that you've been quite agnostic about diet, and you've always had quite a pragmatic approach, actually. So um, <laughs> maybe it's all the other. Maybe <laughs> there are like a, the screeds of podcasts that you've been on that I haven't listened to, where you've come across as a bit more dogmatic and. It's probably just because you're you're used to the scaremongering that exists in the various dietary worlds, whereas those people who aren't exposed that, to that at all, if I then start talking about refined carbohydrates, like all of a sudden yeah, it's yeah. like a really scary thing. So it probably yeah, depends yeah, no, on what so you're true. used to. Um, and lastly, Tommy, any supplements that you take or that you recommend others take with regards to some of these things we've talked about? Yeah, so if you don't include you know, a reasonable amount of seafood in your diet, and by that I mean like a, a good serving once or twice a week, um, 
then I would consider uh, supplementing with, with some kind of uh, fish oil or, or omega-3. I think that people should check mm. their vitamin D levels. And if they're less than 40 or 100, depending on which units you use, I would consider supplementing. But also, if you supplement with vitamin D, you should mm. continue to recheck your levels because you can... It's hard to overdo mm. it, but you can do it. And it's a, it's a fat-soluble vitamin, so it's worth just checking. I usually take magnesium in the evenings. Um, it may help sleep. I also probably lose a lot because I sweat a lot. Same for zinc. So sometimes I supplement with some zinc. Uh, and then some copper to go to go with that. Because um, I've certainly seen in some athletes that they take a lot of zinc. They think it improves their immunity. Usually the type that they take is hasn't really been shown to improve immunity but it can reduce copper levels like they, they can interact so to so take some copper balance with your zinc if you take zinc yeah, yeah. i take creatine with workouts and i think most people should probably take creatine it's great for the brain yeah. reduced risk of depression has been shown to t- treat depression reduced uh, risk if you're then going to have a brain injury it, 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 it's probably beneficial to have more creatine on board so uh, creatine is one the the other things that i supplement occasionally with their sort of high volume resistance training associated so i take some beta alanine and some citrulline because oh, nice. they can sort of improve uh, important uh, performance with that kind of stuff uh in the gym but i don't, I don't think it's necessary, you know unless somebody is going to go and do a load of you know high rep squats or deadlifts or whatever if you want to do that then i think those are useful but if you're not then then I, then I don't think they add much so yeah creatine fish oil vitamin d um i think most people are could probably get a bit more magnesium so yeah. you know that's that's a, it's a low risk super cheap supplement so that, that that's probably about it for, for sort of like general recommendations nice tommy well i mean you're a lot smarter than i am but i am on the same page as as what you talked about except with the neon comment wasn't sure what you meant by that i don't think there's anything wrong with wearing a bit of neon but, so you know. actually actually not it's, it that makes fun of myself a little bit as well because i have some uh some neon weightlifting shoes i have a neon weightlifting <laughs> belt my uh the power rack in my gym is like a neon green yeah so so i was absolutely including myself okay in that. yeah yeah and so at least now I... you're in your home gym it's only you your boxes and your wife that will see you in the neon so you can you know neon it up <laughs> yeah 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 exactly and i actually just got a new uh i think i just got a new t-shirt that has like a, a neon uh design on the front so i'm i'm certainly partial to a bit of neon myself <laughs> um and that's probably harkens back to my old CrossFit days. <gasps> nice. Love it. Tommy, look, thank you so much for your time today. I've really talked about nothing which I thought I would talk about other than like maybe one question or two. <laughs> um, but you were such a wealth of information. However, I do know, um, again, just from listening to you, that you don't necessarily like to be called an expert in anything. Um, yet you are like, you know so much about about so much um i don't know where you find the time to kind of like do all the research that you do but obviously it's a bit of a passion for you as well i I guess again i'm lucky now because i'm involved in various projects that sort of help keep me updated and i know smart people who when interesting stuff happens they'll they'll send it to me so that that's that certainly helps and it is sometimes overwhelming so there'll be times when you know i have to cut myself off from all podcasts and blog posts and social media and just because you you can't deal with the overwhelm and actually learning that it's okay to do that sometimes was 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 a was a important uh lesson for me as well because it's something that i used to struggle with so you know continue to learn but it shouldn't be a stressful process nice and you know in an academic position it's basically by virtue of just like going on to pubmed you're working which is yeah. kind of nice because that's also really <laughs> awesome at the same time <laughs> oh yeah what, what what's great is I had sort of, you know, I have these two strands to my work, right? I have the neonatal brain injury work, which is my main core academic work. And then I have all this other stuff, human health and performance, which has always been on the side. And now slowly, as I sort of work my way up the academic ranks, I'm like bringing these streams together. Oh, so like now we're looking magic. at like prem- like premature birth and later metabolic health risk and later brain injury risk and all this kind of stuff. So slowly these things are becoming one as part of my general career, which is really nice because then anything I do in this world is, is, is relevant to all this other stuff that I do, even if it's only me that knows or can figure <laughs> out why it's relevant. <laughs> that's, that's awesome, Tommy. Um, thank you so much for your time. Um, where can people find you? Um, the easiest place is probably on Instagram. That's where I'll post most frequently, even though it's not that frequently. But um, I'll, I'm at Dr. Tommy Wood, Dr. Tommy Wood on Instagram. Uh, I try to respond to all the direct messages I get on Instagram, so that's usually the best the best place to get a hold of me. That's awesome. Thanks, Tommy. Thank you. This is great.
All right, team. Unsurprisingly, could have talked to Tommy all day. And as I said, he was just super generous with his time and is really happy to come on again. So I'm really wanting to do a deep dive into those blood biomarkers that he has, uh, a course that he's developed. Um, in addition to talking to him about his most recent publication actually looking at gut health metabolic flexibility and the importance of fiber or an animal only diet super interesting stuff so let's hope that in the not too distant future we can chat to tommy about that stuff again as i said what we talked about will be available in the show notes if you want to explore any of those topics uh, again and touch base with tommy over on instagram at dr tommy wood of course, until then, you can contact me over on Facebook at Mickey Willardin Nutrition. I'm pretty much all over Instagram, more so than anywhere else, at Mickey Willardin. Twitter, where I post a lot of my papers that I'm currently kind of exploring and interested in, at Mickey Willardin. Or, of course, over on my website, mickeywillardin.com, where you can book a consultation or sign up to one of my online coaching programs of which one of them is launching this week which is Monday Matters an eight-week guided fat loss program if you missed out this time don't you worry because this is going to be an ongoing guided course that I'm going to run several times a year because I know that people are just really interested in helping improve their health but doing it with a community so that's what I've developed there until then, looking forward to bringing to you next week my conversation with Sean Collins all about all things ultra-distance running. So until then, team, have a fab week. See you later.